me. I, I've been noticing the quotes here. I'm like, what did I actually say? All right, so uh, here we get a brain. We, we've all brought one with us, so thanks for, uh, for bringing your brain. I, I don't think they put that in the brochure, but I'm, I'm sure you've all got it. Um, we would all like our brains to be as functional as possible to make us very smart. Um, John Wayne said something appropriate about this. Um, so you know, we want our lives to be easy. I'm going to be talking about drugs and, and other compounds, things that a person can bring into their body exogenously to make their brain hopefully work better for the situations that they find themselves in. Drugs is kind of a dirty word, um, you know, in, in most parts of the world. We've got all these different, you know, you've got drugs, you've got compounds, you've got medicines, you've got vitamins, all of these words that have um, kind of similar definitions but very different connotations. And, you know, when we, we use the word drugs, we're, we're pretty comfortable with, like, thinking of, you know, this is, like, a, a viable use of a drug. And we know that also drugs might kind of make us like this guy. And probably at some point all of us have used drugs and wound up like this guy. But what I would like you to consider is that drugs can also make you like this guy. This is uh, Nikola Tesla from before the, uh, the car company of the same name. So back in the mid-80s, in the Nancy Reagan era, there was a, a famous uh, commercial, I guess, or a public service announcement about this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. It was something like this. We've got a, here's your brain. This is a um, you know, non-factory chicken, a free-range chicken brain. And I would like to convince you that this is what your brain sh oh, should actually, eh, can I go back? This is what your brain should actually be like on drugs. Something with a, a dial that you can carefully adjust to make it behave just like you want. But before we can talk about that, before we can talk about optimizing your brain, um, first of all, it's important to just kind of bring it up to the baseline that it should be operating at. Most of us are probably inadvertently or, or possibly even adver advertently uh, doing some things which might be non-optimal for our brain. So I want to go through a list of brain banes. This is a list put together by um, the US, uh, I think it was actually the Department of Health, of the 12 most common neurotoxic compounds that people wind up being exposed to. I'm not sure if this is true in all parts of the world, but we've got some, uh, some fairly famous ones. Um, lead still does incredible amounts of damage all over the place. Um, you know, it's still in a lot of paint and um, stuff like that. Ethanol is something that we're probably more familiar with than we should be. That's sort of one of our, our voluntary neurotoxins that we still do quite a bit of. But anyway, the big gains to be had by just keeping, keeping the bad stuff out of your body, out of your brain, whenever possible. Um, we've also been talking this weekend a lot about food. I'm sure there will be much more food talk. One of my favorite food heuristics is, um, you know, this old couple reminds me of them. You know, there's, there's a bazillion foods that you can eat to do something great for you, but um, if, if there's one simple rule that really works well, it's to think, is the food that I'm eating something that, like, my great-grandparents would have recognized as food? And if the answer is no, if they would have, like, you know, looked at the, you know, Triscuit or something, or, like, you know, whatever the individual kernel of Captain Crunch is, and be like, I, I don't know what this is, sorry. Um, you, you probably shouldn't be eating it. That's just like an easy way of kind of keeping a lot of bad stuff out of your diet. Another brain bane is not getting enough sleep. This guy looks like uh, you know, he's could use a nap or two. We've been talking a lot about uh, you know, optimal sleep. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that, but it's obviously something that is very, very important. Um, something we probably won't be talking much about is television, but this was uh, Winston Churchill, his thoughts on television back in the time when it came out. I still think this is just awesome, so I want to throw that in there. And finally, some just like bad, there, there is bad body hacking, bad, bad brain hacking that sometimes goes on. I actually tried this. How many of you have heard of the Uberman sleep schedule? Yeah, yeah, me, me, me too, unfortunately. So the, the, the quick version of this is like, you know, a normal human sleeps something like this. You're awake for 16 or so hours a day. You sleep for eight hours a day. The, the idea with Uberman is that you can sleep in these like 20 minute little kernels and then like, but you have to sleep every like three hours and 40 minutes or whatever it is. You sleep in like six little pinwheels throughout the day and it just, you go on like that forever. And there are people that claim that you can do this. I actually, I made a very concerted effort to try this once. This was probably about four or five years ago. 
But um, yeah, I, I personally believe it can't be done. And the funny thing is, that you'll find websites describing how this can be done and uh, like online personalities that say they've done it. But y you can't get them to return phone calls. It's like I've tried to get them to, interview th uh, to be interviewed on my podcast. But despite the fact these people are allegedly awake 24 hours a day, they're, they're nowhere to be found. So I smell a rat. So moving on to optimization, um, here, here's sort of the paradigm that I want to go through in this talk. Uh, optimizing, then extending your brain's abilities, and finally expanding them. So uh, let's start with optimize. Optimize, pushing your brain to its maximum performance. And I, I, I guess, you know, talking about smart drugs and the concept of improving intelligence, a lot of times people ask, you know, well, what's, what's the best smart drug? And of course, it, you know, th that one always kind of drives me nuts because it, it really depends on what you're trying to get your brain to do at the time. Um, you know, all of us have cycles within our lives. You want to be restful sometimes. You want to be alert sometimes. You, you, you want to be, um, you know, social sometimes. Sometimes you want to bear down and get work done. So there, there isn't a, a correct, um, you know, exogenous modifier for your brain for all occasions at all times. But I, th I find that a good way of kind of thinking about the various dials and levers that we can pull within our brain breaks down into these four. Wakefulness, mood, energy and focus, and creativity. And so we're going to kind of go through some, like a very non-exhaustive list of the different ways that we can affect these things. So we'll start with wakefulness. Uh, and oh, oh, I think I might have pushed this one too many times. No? OK. So I believe these are tea leaves. And if uh, some horticulturalist in the audience wants to tell me that that's not actually tea, I will accept their judgment. But um, I wanted to talk first about green tea and its uh, constituent elements of caffeine and something called L-theanine, which work pretty well together because caffeine is, you know, as we know, a cognitive stimulant. It's probably the uh, most widely used psychoactive compound in the world and you know, has been for time immemorial. But um, L-theanine, which is something that occurs naturally in green tea, is um, a, a GABA promoting. GABA is a neurotransmitter that kind of calms you down, chills you out. And one of the reasons that green tea, despite the fact that it has caffeine like other teas, it is not something that makes you like wired and jittery is because kind of the, the GABA promoting benefits of the L-theanine help take the edge off. So you can still feel like, you know, very cognitively sharp, but not necessarily like having the jitters when you have, you know, one too many cups perhaps. Um, they've actually done studies and found that the ratio of caffeine to L-theanine that occurs naturally in green tea is not what's optimal for the brain. I think it's a, like a, about a two to one in favor of caffeine in the plant. But when you buy a, um, a pill form, they generally reverse that ratio and, and have actually more L-theanine than they do caffeine. Uh, L-theanine is also something if for whatever reason you just, you're already drinking a coffee, you can just add it directly to uh, your, your ca caffeine existing um, you know, beverage of choice. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about this misconception. So we, we've got this, you know, horrible idea that like brawn and brain are like the opposite of one another, and that these two are, are sort of the, the natural enemies. And that you know, the, the top guy's dumb and the, the bottom guy's smart, and you can tell because he's got glasses or, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. So so this is what popular culture would have us believe. But the truth is, and, and you know, we're at a biohacking conference, so we all know better. It's, it's probably more like this. It's disinformation put out by this guy trying to get everybody to not exercise so that their brains won't be as good as they possibly could be. W one of the um, kind of great nuggets of wisdom, I guess I got like very early in my podcast talking with one of the, uh, the doctors I was interviewing was that heart health is brain health. And pretty much anything that you can do that's good for your heart, good for your overall cardiovascular system, is going to be good for your brain. There, there is, is no exception to that rule that she knew of at the time. This was probably two or three years ago now. I don't think that's changed. So um, you can just kind of you know, you know, file that one away. Anything that's going to be good, whether that's you know, exercise, a dietary choice, whatever, if you're helping your heart, your cardiovascular system, your brain is going to be picking up benefits too. Um, also on the wakefulness tip, so this is a uh, rhodiola rosea. This is, is it's known by many names, and it's been known for a long, long time to be a helpful um, uh, plant. It's actually it's the root of this plant, which I, I didn't have a picture of the root, but this seemed prettier. That um, is is where people can draw their benefits. But this was actually talked about in Jason and the Argonauts. If you remember back to you know your Greek mythology and stuff, and I think it was Medea, but uh, 
Jason needed to kill like some fire-breathing bulls, and he wasn't going to be able to do it on his own. But kind of the, like in, in the original version of like you know Popeye drinking the spinach and like getting super muscles, uh, Medea gave Jason some of this, some uh, rhodiola rosea, and it made him indestructible. So if you're ever fighting fire-breathing bulls, this is the nootropic of choice. But this is something which gives uh, both mental and physical energy, but definitely is, is a strong one for wakefulness and really sort of any sort of uh, you know, physical recuperation, surviving in tough environments. This grows in like, you know, way high up in the mountains where it's very cold and uh, apparently some of the same things that allow it to survive as a plant in very difficult environments that can be you know, passed on to the animals that eat it, including us. Also on the wakefulness tip, so this is uh, actually I think this is a, a modafinil pill, but so I'm going to be talking about three compounds here: the the afinil family, adrafinil, modafinil, and armodafinil, all of which are sort of kissing cousins chemically. Um, adrafinil, interestingly, is actually legal to be bought over the counter in the U.S. and I think most parts of the world, and whereas modafinil, which is slightly better known, is a prescription drug in most places and is actually sold as an anti-narcolepsy. Um, like, like that is the, the proper prescription is for narcoleptics. People are going to fall asleep. But it is um, something which basically removes sleep pressure. It, it makes you be able to voluntarily go to sleep but not feel like you have to go to sleep against your will, as you do sometimes. Um, but yeah, adrafinil, interestingly, when you uh, eat it, it breaks down in your body into modafinil, but like at a one to three ratio. So if you ate 300 milligrams of Adrafinil, you wind up with 100 milligrams of modafinil with, within your body. So you can kind of like sidestep the fact that it's a, um, a prescription drug by buying the, the precursor, adrafinil. There, there, the downside there is that there's some more wear and tear on your liver in the process of that breakdown. So there, there's toss-ups on all these things. Um, and then its other cousin, armodafinil, is pretty much, it's, it's almost the same thing as modafinil, but... Um, well, this is an interesting one, actually. I'll, I'll go into this. So the R in armodafinil, even though it's written A-R, it's not like R for pirates. It's R for right. Like, remember earlier when I was talking about L-theanine um, as being something that exists in green tea? Well, the L there is for left, whereas the, uh, the R here is for right. And that's because um, protein, uh, uh, some biochemist is going to get mad at me here, but different compounds can curve to the right or to the left. Um, basically, it's it, you know, a string of compounds together, and they curve one way or the other. And uh, apparently, the right curved version of the modafinil compound, for most people, is slightly more bioactive than the left curved version. And so um, it, when you take regular modafinil, it's just kind of a 50-50 random assortment of right and left-handed modafinil molecules. Whereas uh, our modafinil, they strain out the left-handers, and they just give you the, the straight stuff um, of, of the, the right-handed curves. And for most people, it's a little bit stronger that way. You take a dose that's about 25% less. It's kind of a, a random trivia piece there. Um, so wakefulness, obviously taking naps. We've talked about it before. Uh, I, I was going to say something about the caffeine nap, but somebody beat me to it, which is what happens when you go too late in the day on these things. But yeah, caffeine naps are, are absolutely fantastic. I feel like I've got more to say about caffeine. Um, but yeah, the, uh, like I said, most widely used psychoactive compound in the world, something like 90% of all adults in the world take caffeine in some form every day. They have a very hard time doing studies on caffeine because they can't find caffeine-naive audiences like that, that haven't tried it before to actually run a, a study on where people don't already have familiarity and tolerance. Um, yeah, th I think that's all we got for wakefulness. We'll quickly talk about mood, which actually does feed into um, in intelligence, or at least the, the products that we generally want from intelligence, we're sure getting smart things done. If you're in a better mood, you're more likely to actually do things. As um, you know, the, the, the opposite end of the spectrum, people that are depressed, they don't tend to get very much done. So, plus the fact just being in a good mood is fun. It's a, a reward unto itself. One thing that I feel like uh, we, we probably don't put enough emphasis on is music. Like, I, I feel like Music is such an easy hack for us to use, especially now that we can all carry around earphones and iPods and all that stuff all the time. Um, you know, the, nary is a week that goes by that I don't wake up at like at least two days by blurring some Led Zeppelin and just like 
charging myself up for the day, and I know that puts me in a better mood. And I'm not saying that Led Zeppelin needs to be the thing for you, but I'm sure you've all got your favorite pieces of music. Um, interestingly, I actually interviewed a guy recently who studies the effects of music on the brain, and there's about 4% of people who just don't really like music. Like, it's not that they don't like country music or they don't like rap music. It's like they just, there's n not any music that really does it for them. And, and they're, they're very shy about it because the, the other 96% of us are like, what, you don't like any music? And so they just kind of keep quiet about it. But there, there is like this small minority of people who, for whom this would not be a good hack. But yeah, for most of us, I feel like having a, um, a, a various playlist for the type of things that we want to accomplish would be, um, you know, it's, it's an easy win. This here is something called lemon balm. And lemon balm is, it's, it's been known about, again, forever. There's, there's a, um, a horticulturalist from like the 16th century that was like, lemon balm dispels all thoughts of care and, and, and causes like mirth and joviality and you and all of yours. And uh, very, very um, but anyway, the, the science has backed it up. They've done a lot of studies into uh, this compound and at, at low doses, it actually tends to um, Im improve cognition, makes people you know, behave slightly better on tests and things like that, but doesn't have much of a mood effect. But as you take a higher dose, it actually it calms you down, it makes you a little bit less um, you know, with it in your responses, but the mood effects become very strong. And, and unlike almost everything else that I'll be talking about here, yeah, this actually tastes good. The, um, the extract of lemon balm does taste kind of lemony. You can like put a dropper full of it straight into tea, and it's... Um, yeah, about the only thing here that I would, I would recommend as a, as a food in its own right. But yeah, not a lot of people know about this. It is a, a nice little mental mood pick-me-up. Energy and focus. So uh, here we got Maximus here. He, he looks very energetic and, and very focused. And these things, I, I was thinking about doing them separately, but they almost always go together. And it kind of makes sense in, in the real world, uh, or, or rather, the, the, you know, the real Paleolithic world, we can see why energy and focus would have been two peas in a pot. Like, you know, now I want to get focused and I want to sit at my laptop for a long time and do something. And the fact that, like, physical energy oftentimes comes along with that is, is a little bit of a bummer. It's a downside. But, you know, back in the day, when, when you were getting ready to focus on something cognitively, you were probably, like, you know, trying to get the, you know, woolly mammoth to go down the ravine you wanted to, like, run where all your buddies were waiting with the spears and the net and stuff like that. And so the, the, the burst of physical energy and the mental focus were something that really should have come together. And most of the things that are going to be affecting um, energy and focus are going to be affecting the neurotransmitter dopamine in one way or another. Dopamine, um, you know, I, I guess was sort of popularized in as, as a reward neurotransmitter, but really it's more of a motivational one. The, what dopamine does is, it, it, at the risk of oversimplifying, is when you might like something, but without dopamine, it, regardless of how much you like it, you're not willing to exert effort to get it. Dopamine is what makes you go from like, oh, that girl across the room is cute, to I'm actually going to you know, get up the nerve to go talk to that girl because my, my motivation is there for it. Um, this here, this, uh, I'm going to have a couple pictures of just, you know, piles of powder, so you'll have to take my word for what it is. But this is meant to be a, a choline group, something like uh, cetacholine or uh, alpha-GPC. But um, there, are, there are several different choline precursors, or, or rather acetylcholine precursors. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter within the brain, is mainly excitatory. And you, you can get choline in things like eggs. It's, it's there in various parts of the diet. I'm sure that it's probably been talked about before today and will be talked about again. But yeah, choline can be great for energy for, uh, for almost anybody. This is co something called methylene blue. This is pretty far out there. It's a, it's a chemical that's been around for a long time. It is a synthetic compound, but um, actually the term magic bullet was originally used about, I think, like 130 or so years ago for this particular compound because uh, the scientists that were studying at the time realized that it tended to accumulate in various tissues, and particularly it accumulated in active nerve tissues, nerve cells that were you know, firing and being active. That's if you put it into a, a rat or whatever, dissected the rat, it's like the, the parts of the, the rat's nervous system that were most active, that's where the, um, the methylene blue had, had accumulated. And so that it, this was actually led to the idea of chemotherapy, of having chemicals that would direct themselves to specific tissues. So methylene blue is actually, in the, in the history of medical science, this is an important one. It, it's, um, 
a prescription compound in most parts of the world, I, I think maybe in all parts of the world, it's not something that should be treated too lightly because while it can be very, very good if you get the dosage correct, it's one of these ones where the ratio between the correct dose and a dangerously high dose is not that much. So um, a, a little bit too much could actually be pretty dangerous. The, there's not a lot of um, room for variance there. But like I said, it, it pretty much aims itself at active nerve cells, and it tends to promote. Um, it, well, one thing they found that it, it promotes uh, the use of oxygen, so basically oxygen throughput in those nerve cells, it accelerates the, um, the, the behavior of the mitochondria in producing ATP, so basically just gives more energy to nerve cells to do their thing. So um, they found that, again, with, with the dosage correct, methylene blue uh, promotes every form of memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, all that stuff. Um, yeah, in increases just response speed the ability to get the correct answer or to inhibit movement. Um, it's, again, it, it's, and it turns your pee blue also. <laughs> Which, so yeah, very, very interesting compound. Um, worth looking into, but not something for the, uh, the, the faint of heart. It's something to talk with your doctor about if you're interested in. Um, also to be talking with your doctor about if you're interested in, are, the next two are both ADHD um, drugs. This one is Ritalin or methylphenidate is the official name. Uh, Ritalin, by the way, is, is named after the inventor's wife, Rita, who I, I think was a narcoleptic or something like that. She didn't actually have ADHD, but uh, the, the guy who synthesized it first, he invented this trying to help out his wife. Um, it wound up becoming, of course, one of the world's most famous drugs, and now it's named after her. So a little bit of Ritalin trivia. Um, but it is a, a compound made from two amphetamine salts. And as an amphetamine, it does have the you know, potential for addiction and things like that. It is definitely a cognitive enhancer. I mean, people do, um, you know, you, you get more answers correct faster. It's like you're, you're basically your brain is revved up when you're on it. But there's the potential for addiction. There's the potential for long-term use could cause heart problems later on. So it, it, there's, there's definitely trade-offs. And again, getting the dosage right on these things is, is very much... Um, where the rubber really meets the road. The next one, as you might guess, is Adderall. Uh, these two are kind of um, neck and neck, I guess, as far as the treatment of ADHD. And interestingly, doctors don't really have like a, a favored one to prescribe because about 25% of people respond well to Ritalin, about 25% of people uh, respond well to Adderall, and the other 50 kind of respond equally well to either one. So it's kind of like a coin toss um, as to what they try for whom. Generally, Adderall, um, I've never tried Adderall myself, so this is sort of hearsay, but I've, I've talked with quite a few people about it. Adderall is, um, you, you feel like you're, you're on something and kind of really hyper-accelerated more than Ritalin. Ritalin seems like it's um, something that you, you might be able to sort of fly under the radar of not feeling like you're on a drug all the time when you're on it. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, and, and I guess this is sort of where we end the energy and focus, because this is kind of as, as far as it goes, other than just like doing a you know, straight methamphetamine. And interestingly, uh, pharmaceutical methamphetamine is a thing. I've actually spoken with people who have been prescribed methamphetamine by a doctor. I didn't, I didn't even realize that was a, uh, a possibility, but apparently it is. Finally, we'll talk about creativity, which, um, and, and I guess actually I should take a second here. I, I really view, creativity and focus as being kind of like two ends of a spectrum, where if, you, if you're the more creative you are, probably the less focused you are, and vice versa, um, which, which again just goes against this idea of like, you know, what's the right smart drug? What can I do to be creative and focused? It's like, well, wait a minute, if you're, you know, that's like, what can I do to go right and left? Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, creativity, what do we got here? Um, oh, so a another pile of white powder, look at that. Uh, this is meant. To, this pile of white powder is meant to re represent the racetam family of chemicals. There are quite a few racetams. The original uh, compound that was given the term nootropic was something called piracetam, which was invented in I think the mid 1960s by a European scientist, and um, you know it was was shown at the time uh, you know to produce good results for people that were starting to suffer from cognitive dementia, um, you know, pre-Alzheimer's symptoms, things like that. And it, it works really well for people whose brains are sort of starting to slope off later in life. 
and they wound up doing studies on you know, young college students in the prime of life and found that although the effects weren't as extreme, uh, again, they saw benefits in memory, benefits in verbal acuity, lots of different good things. And so kind of getting in inspired by this, they started looking at, well, what are some related compounds to this um, sort of progenitor chemical? And at this point, there's um, you know, puracetam, aniracetam, oxyracetam, pramiracetam, like a, a list of like 20 or 30 things. The older ones have been tested more, have a lot more human testing in history, so I would generally feel safer with those. Um, I, I've tried piracetam, and I, I'm personally a non-responder to it. I just, I can't feel it, which doesn't necessarily mean it's not doing anything. It's, it's been shown to be neuroprotective, so, you know, neuroprotection is good whether you're feeling anything or not. Um, aniracetam has become my racetam of choice. One interesting thing about the racetams is they're really, they're, they're not all the same, particularly in the dosing. Piracetam is almost like a, a horse pill, like the dosage that you take can be up to like 12 grams a day in some cases, so not milligrams, but actual grams, so like spoonful after spoonful of the stuff. Um, whereas I, I spoke with somebody last night, I will uh, keep, keep the names nameless, but um, th this person was on Pramiracetam, and Pramiracetam is something like 1,000 times more potent. So you're talking the milligram range versus the gram range than uh, the related compound, Puracetam. Uh, th there's also one, a, a Russian compound called Nuopept, which even though it doesn't have that racetam suffix in the name, was again inspired by the racetam family of chemicals. And they were like, okay, how can we adjust the dials biochemically to do some similar things, but without having you know, such a, a, a massive bolus of pill that gets put into a person. And uh, I believe Nuopept is something like 2,000 times more potent uh, you know, per, per molecule than the original racetam. Um, oh yeah, so, so I mentioned racetams in the creativity section. Why did I do that? Because one of the big things about racetams that you'll hear is that they are, are beneficial for memory. But memory and creativity actually are, are strangely interwoven in ways that are not at first apparently obvious. So, um, we've, we've got three kinds of memory that kind of happen. One is something called sensory memory. Sensory memory is like the, the first buffer as information comes in before it gets turned into processable information that we can actually do anything with. So it's, it's just like it's there for a, a fraction of a second and then it's gone. As soon as that sensory memory is gone, that what did you just say when you, you, you know that they said something? Um, it gets put into what's called short-term or working memory. You'll hear those terms um, interchangeably, but they basically mean the same thing. In fact, I, I think they mean exactly the same thing. And then finally, there's long-term memory, which is like the stuff you remember, but it's not kind of there in your brain right now. So um, working memory is the, where they talk about there being five to nine things you can kind of have in your head at one time. Some people it might be five, some people it might be nine, but that's kind of the range. Um, and you know, creativity, I, I think of it as a, as a sort of a two-step process. One is coming up with a bunch of new combinatorial ideas, and then the other is, is sort of winnowing down those ideas and like, that idea is clearly bullshit, that idea is clearly bullshit too, and like recognizing the good one in the bunch and saying, you know, here, here's the creative gem among the creative garbage. So the, the reason that memory and creativity are, are interlinked is because if you have a, a bigger uh, working memory, then basically, you, like, like let's say your working memory, just to keep the numbers simple, you know, you go up to nine from seven. Then instead of being able to like look how seven different things fit together and what the, the potential combinations among those seven are, you've got nine. So there's just there's more combinatorial possibilities there that you can see where's the gem in this mix to uh, to come up with your creativity. So again, just good thing to remember. Anything that you're looking at that, like, this thing is going to be beneficial to memory, you can also think, ah, there might be a creativity uptick there. Now, this guy, uh, we, we talked earlier about the benefits of sleep, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go back on my word, but there will be times when you don't get enough sleep, and it so happens that that can actually be beneficial for your creativity, because, you know, if, if you're feeling tired, the part of your brain that would normally say, you know, that's a stupid idea, don't do that, that, that part of your brain has probably already gone to bed. He keeps normal business hours and he's, he's checked out already. So if you find yourself having to be awake for some reason and you still want to get something done, try to make it creative work or something that would, um, you, you know, you, you're, you're not going to have the, um, you know, the, the tight focus and everything, but the creative work could still be a, um, you know, a, a hidden boon there. Finally, whoa, 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 we're not in the intermission yet.
who's that guy? Uh, he's clearly tripping balls. Um, and it would not be correct to have a talk about uh, drugs and exogenous creativity without talking about psychedelic compounds. This is a, um, I think it's an Alex Gray piece of art. This guy does lots of lots of acid and then uh, does paintings about it. Um, but yeah, LSD, psilocybin, and uh, mescaline, all of those should sort of the, the original psychedelic compounds should be mentioned for creativity. Again, if, if we look at creativity as you know, ideation, coming up with a whole lot of new ideas, and then winnowing those down to you know, which of these ideas is actually the good one. Um, th there is no way that uh, any of the psychedelic compounds will not <laughs> assist in that initial, the first half of that ideation process. They've recently done some studies on exactly what LSD is doing in the brain. Um, it's really interesting. They've been able to start doing these studies for the first time in, in decades now, over the last couple of years. But what they found is that the, the visual images that can appear like when you close your eyes or even when you don't close your eyes, when a person is doing LSD, it's happening because parts of the brain that, that have nothing to do with the optic nerve are funneling information to the uh, visual cortex. So basically, the visual cortex, which would normally be processing the downstream information from your eyes, is just processing thoughts from another part of your brain. So again, this kind of like combinatorial um, combinatorial thinking, and that's where creativity comes up. In this case, you're combining I ideas that existed in, in parts of the brain that were never supposed to be feeding into your visual input stream. Uh, it, it would be impossible not to come up with some novel ideas there. So we'll do a quick intermission. Um, and in our intermission, we'll do a little quiz. So do you think that A, drugs should be used for accelerants or, and cognitively speaking, or for navigation? Raise your hand if you think accelerants. Anybody? Okay, that guy? Okay, we, got, we got a few. What about navigation? Ooh, the, the navigators, I think, have it in the vote, but you are wrong. Because, um, yeah, I'm going accelerant. When you take something like a, a modafinil, say, um, it's, it's going to, anything that's going to affect your dopaminergic system, again, is going to increase your motivation. And, and one of the effects of that is that anything you're looking at or focusing on is going to seem more interesting than it otherwise would. So if you, if you don't decide what you want to get done before you take a dopamine promoting compound, then you might wind up spending you know, all this energy and motivation on something which is, is not really the right thing to do. So you want to do your, your navigation, you know, decide which direction your rudder is pointing before you take something which is going to affect your dopamine, because otherwise everything's going to sound like a good idea. Um, there's, there's the maybe apocryphal, maybe not stories of the, the people that do methamphetamine and then, you know, spend, you know, two days cleaning up their trailer park. And it's like, you know, that's interesting, but it's not a very good use of time. So uh, anyway, don't be that guy. Um, oh, yeah, here, here's a guy trying to, oh, I want to talk real quick about multitasking. Uh, multitasking gets a, a, a nasty reputation. People are like, you know, don't multitask, you can't do that. I, I think multitasking is the wrong word. What you can't do is multifocus. You can't focus on more than one thing at a time. You definitely can multitask. You can walk, you can chew bubble gum, you can carry on a conversation. All those things at once, those are all tasks. Hopefully you're focused on the conversation. You're not you know, mentally focused on the bubble gum. But, um, but yeah, I think it's actually multitasking is great as long as only one of those tasks is sort of anointed as, as the focal one. Um, and here's a picture of, uh, I, he, I don't know how he got in here, but there he is. Um, <laughs> we'll move on to uh, extending, how to keep your brain operating at its maximum. And uh, just, just a couple of ideas that I, I want to have as far as like thinking, okay, what do I want to do optimizing my brain long term? I think the first one is, is to patch the big holes. You know, we, we, earlier on I had the brain veins. It's like if you're drinking too much or something like that, I mean, that, that's a, like an obvious hole to patch. I feel like most of us probably have more to gain from stopping doing the things that we're doing wrong rather than trying to layer on the new things that are right. It, it kind of like the whole the second line there, do less before doing more. It's probably you know, easier to stop eating Cheetos for breakfast than it is to start going to the gym for four hours a week. So um, yeah, r r removing the bad things before adding the good things is uh, probably a good move. And then strive for wisdom. Wisdom. Uh, I, I guess I, I mistyped with a capital W, but it's almost fortuitous because it's an important one. I, I like this quote here a lot from uh, Sam Harris. Wisdom is nothing more profound than an ability to follow your own advice. And I, I think for you know, most of us, you know, if we're at this conference, we're obviously all into self-improvement. And 
chances are you probably know the thing that you could be doing right now to make the biggest impact in your own life. And you know, if, if this conference is the kick in the ass that you need to like justify actually doing it and making the change, then, uh, then make the change. Um, this guy, okay, so routine in an intelligent man is the sign of ambition. And I, th I think there's something to that. Uh, I think we've already talked about morning routines today, but yeah, here's mine from some random day a year ago. But I, I think that having some sort of routine that kind of gets things started off is, is a great move. Um, one thing I like to do every day, you know, random little things come up that you need to get done. I, I call these my unpredictables, and I like to kind of gamify how quickly I can get them knocked off. Like, is this a two-minute task? Is it a five-minute task? And see if I can give myself, like, you know, 30 minutes, and maybe, maybe I can get done in 27 or something. Um, and then I move on to my active brain blocks, kind of the, the blocks of time early in the day when I'm trying to get my most important stuff done. If I'm going to be taking a cognitive enhancer of any point, at any point that's like something that, that takes place within the, the period of a few hours rather than something like fish oil, which has its benefits over the course of you know, years or decades, then, then this is where I, I would take that stuff now or take it early enough where it's going to kick in as I enter my active brain blocks. And as, as far as like you know, the, the daily cognitive stack, I, I do not have something that I, I do absolutely every day. I do believe in kind of mixing it up. I, I try to alternate my creativity days with my focus days because I do see those as being different things. And, um, and, and every now and then, I'll just do a complete washout day and do nothing. I, I try not to have a routine with that. Um, and also, you know, hat tip to the whole idea of intermittent fasting. I found that to be a really, really good cognitive hack. Uh, I rock, but I gotta stop. I just got the red flashing light. Okay, well, this is God. Uh, he shall, says, thou shall not slog. If you find yourself slogging through something and uh, you're, you're trying to force yourself to work on it and you're just not feeling it, move on. Um, and I've gotta move on too because I'm down to zero minutes. So thank you very much. <laughs> what happens now? All right. How about some questions and answers? Anybody has any questions? Yes? Can we have a mic here, please? Ah, and then to you. You can yell. Hi. I don't need to yell. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, there's, yeah. a, there's a one over here, oh, no, one coming over here. here. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. And uh, I also heard that uh, creatine has an effect as a nootropic. Um, can you tell us something about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that the primary effects of creatine are because it, it improves blood vessel growth. And of course, the brain is, is thirsty for blood like most other organs. But uh, the more blood vessels and capillaries that you have feeding oxygen and glucose to the brain, the better the brain can do cognitively demanding tasks. So yeah, creatine, I mean, like I said, this was a, a totally non-exhaustive list. There's no way, I mean, I, I ran over time as it was, and it would have been worse if I'd gone through everything. But yeah, we, we did an episode on creatine where we talked specifically about the, um, the cognitive enhancing properties of it. And, and yeah, it, it's something I think it's great to you know, work into your system, you know, cycle in, cycle off, but nothing but good things to say about it. Here. Hey, thanks for uh, that talk, Jesse. Um, how concerned are you with the biological costs of taking something like a nootropic? And if I illustrate that with something else to say, one of these like blue lights that's shown to improve productivity, right. you know, the study might show that, but it's not showing that uh, it's like knocking off your circadian rhythm in the SCN or it's traveling through the upper layers of your skin to the, like, the lower dermis and leading to psoriasis. The, the like studies that are out there are almost they're biased by like the researcher and what they're looking for. So we just don't we can't see this bigger picture, and we do a pretty good job of like fucking ourselves up in the long run with doing these little things that we think are healthy. I I, I think most of us here are somewhat on the experimental fringe, and you know we, we realize that you know the new studies are coming out on everything all the time, and we don't really know some of the things we think are great ideas now are going to be proven to be terrible ideas. Hopefully not terrible, maybe not as good as we thought. Um, you know, as more data comes out, I, I interviewed a guy who has like 190 IQs, like you know, one of one of the official smartest guys in the world, and he takes something like 50 pills a day. And and he said something that was great. He said, "I take 50 pills a day. I'm pretty sure only a third of them are actually doing something, but I don't know which third it is." And, and he's got like <laughs> 190 IQ, and I'm like, "Man, fuck! If 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 he feels that, I mean, I guess I feel that way too." Um, and how 
have you stopped yourself like becoming obsessive about it? So about 18 months ago, I had, you know, my whole counter was full of shit. Yeah. And it gets ridiculous, whereas now I'm like the opposite. If I can't close my suitcase because I've got too many pills, then I, I, I cut myself off. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so people are different, and what works for me may not work for you. What do you think is the way to find out what is actually good for me, apart from taking every single pill and sort of like do it by trial and error. Oh, well, that's what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, I've, uh, some genetic tests, you know. I, I'm, I'm super glad you asked. So, so I've, I've spoken with probably over a half dozen people for whom caffeine makes them sleepy. So it, it, just as an example of like how varied people's reactions to things are, um, it, it's all over the map. So I, I feel like the, the, if you're curious about something, the thing to do is to you know, look at what the best case scenarios are, the people that really like it, what do they say happens? Look at what the worst case scenarios are, the people have horrible repercussions, what happens to them? You know, figure out where your level of, of you know, risk versus reward is, and then try it or don't try it and see how it works for you. Because honestly, just because it works for your friend Bob or Sheila or whatever, doesn't mean that you're going to like it, but you know, maybe, maybe you'll love it, who knows? It's a, it's a weird hobby being into this kind of stuff because, I mean, it kind of requires a little bit of self-experimentation. We have time for one more. Anybody else? This one. Uh, Over here. All the way in the wall. So I have a question about Parasita. Uh, I heard some people stack it with uh, other kinds of natural substances. Yeah, what, what do you, what's your comment on the stacking paracetam with other natural stacks for memory or focus? Um, paracetam, in, in fact, most of the racetams, you'll oftentimes hear about stacking them with a choline group or at least making sure that you eat enough cholines in your diet because um, one of the things that the racetams do is they tend to make your brain burn through acetylcholine faster, and so you kind of need to replenish that. Um, so, so, so that's sort of a, a natural pairing you'll see. In fact, I, th I think that might be where the term stacking originally came from, is, is stacking together a racetam and a choline group. But yeah, I'll, I'll, you'll see a lot of people take paracetam with, with acetylcholine or um, uh, alpha-GPC. The, the C in alpha-GPC is, again, choline. All right. So how about a big round of applause for Mr. Jesse Lawler? Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.